Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 163 of McRae Live. The date today is Friday, April the 16th, 2021. It is 1.17 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And today on the program, on the show, I have somebody that uh, I cannot wait to talk to. If you recall, uh, was it last week or the week before? I can't remember now. I did an episode where I talked about a little USC film called Judson's Release or you might know it as Foster's release because I think that's what it was actually released under. There are reasons for it, of course, which I went into into that show. Uh, But the director of that movie reached out to me, which is great because there's a lot of influence here and we're gonna talk about it. We are gonna talk about it and we're gonna talk about his career as well. He was co-writer on The Howling. If you guys remember the early 80s werewolf movie, The Howling, I certainly do as a young kid walking into the video store and seeing the cover on the... Yeah, we all do. Uh, And then, of course, uh, and other things, too. He's got a wealth of experience. He's been in the business for a long time. I welcome to the show, of course, Terrence H. Winkless. How are you, sir? Welcome. I'm excellent, Dave. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think it's so cool that we live in a day and age where I can find, to me anyway, this really obscure film that I've never heard of that's over 40, nearly 50 years old. I go on YouTube and say, hey, this is great. I don't know if anybody knows anybody. It'd be great. And then a week later, here we are chatting, which I think is yeah, amazing. It's, it's astounding. It's I'm I'm glad I I'm glad I reached out and here I am. Absolutely. I I really appreciate it. Um let's start with uh of course who you are and your experience and you've been in the business obviously for uh, a very long time which is and your wealth of experience obviously speaks for itself. Let's start with um you know well yeah, I mean let's go back to USC. And let's start there, uh, because okay. uh, tell me about it. What made you go to USC? Why were you there? What was the experience like? I'd been in college in Southern Illinois, and uh, it was the only school I could get into because my grades in high school were not great. So when I, I went you. to Southern Illinois, I was I was the smartest one in the room. So I was able to excel. Uh, the school had one film course. Wow. I decided wow. somewhere along the line that I wanted to be in films. They had one film course I took it. It was about, actually, it was about making uh, stuff for newscasts. You're supposed to do a, a, a <laughs> you were supposed to do a 30 second film about whatever the heck. Of course, I did a, a, a film that was a minute and 10 seconds long. I'm not going to go into what it was. It was okay. I did it fairly well. Uh, and the guy said, you, you did it great, but the, the assignment was 30 seconds. You did a minute and 10. What the hell? <laughs> so I, I did that. It wet my whistle for it. And I went to the library. Remember libraries uh, <laughs> and looked up USC and it said, well, we've got 80 courses in filmmaking instead of the one that I'd had at uh, Southern Illinois. So mm-hmm. I applied to uh, USC. Coincidentally, I might as well get into this now. Um, Let's do it up. USC and this other event of my life are concurrent. Um, my dad was a guy who wrote commercials for Kellogg's. And he did Snap, Crackle Pop, Rice Krispies, and he did Good Morning, Good Morning, The Best of You Each Morning, and so on. And he, he produced a lot of this stuff in addition to writing it. writing it. So he got friendly with... Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera, who were the guys who animated, uh, they were animators, great animators. Yes. Famous, Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they set out to do their first live action TV show, which was going to take these wild, colorful characters that were just like cartoon characters, except there were going to be people inside the suits. And my dad said, gee, I know just the guys to be in those suits. And he meant me and my two brothers, my brother, Jeff, seven years older, my younger brother, Dan, two years younger. And I all wound up in these suits. I was Bingo the gorilla. Jeff was, uh, my older brother, Jeff was uh, Flegel the dog. And my younger brother, Danny was uh, Drooper the lion. So I drove home from college on a Friday. My mother said, you're gonna go to California on Monday and try up to the show. 
I packed a bag for three days and I stayed for 34 years. Boy, those clothes were sure worn out. <laughs> um, anyway, it was great fun. And simultaneously I applied to USC. I just sorry. wanted to ask you, sorry, um, yeah. before we began the show, you, you said you had a set of headphones. Do you, uh, do you think you could try plugging those in? I just want to see if it makes a bit of a difference uh, yeah. a little bit. Sorry about that. I, I uh, uh, just want to make sure that, that everything's okay and to eliminate a lot of the stuff, but you sounded loud and clear and, and it was, uh, Once I, they, they have to turn on and, Oh, they're wireless. I'm I, impressed. I believe I can hear you now. Oh, there we go. So your default speaker is going to yay a bit. Okay. Okay, now the audio, I'm oh, saying the audio isn't as good, unfortunately. You know what? Let's, I'll tell you what, let's go back with the headphones off because your audio actually is better without them. And I'll just make sure I don't laugh too much while you're talking <laughs> so people hear my feedback. Hang on. Let's wait till it stops. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't hear you yet. One minute, folks. Stand by. There we go. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. Yes. Okay. That's better. You're okay. Back. My apologies. Okay. Um, I, uh, yeah, it was, uh, your audio actually is better without them. So I'll just make sure that when you say something funny, I don't laugh too hard and, <laughs> and cause any feedback. Um, right. Fascinating. Now, of course, you're talking about the banana splits, which I, I am had never heard of until I started right. reading more about you. Is, is a little bit before my time, probably about 10 years before. I was born in 79. So, right. uh, But tell me about this. I mean, this was a, a fairly big show. Well, as I say, Hanna-Barbera set up to do their first live action show they had, uh, there was going to be these colorful characters, that is the banana splits, the guys in costumes, introducing cartoons that Hanna-Barbera did. I don't think I ever saw any of them. It, it was on on Saturday morning on NBC, and the, the Three Musketeers, and I, I don't, I didn't watch any of the cartoons. I managed to get myself up in front of the TV at 9.30 on a Saturday morning, which when you're in college is very early, as you know. Yes. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> but you know, when you're the guy in that funny suit, you're going to get up and you're going to watch it. Mind you in 68, it was before I had a color TV. Um, so I was watching myself in black and white. I can't even imagine it now on a, you know, a 12 inch screen, probably the size of the computer I'm looking at. And uh, it was a trip and a half. And, and indeed, we had uh, Richard Donner was the director. He had been doing, he had done for them, he had done for Hanna-Barbera some other live action thing. Uh, Danger Island, it was called. I think they shot it in Mexico with Jan Michael Vincent. He's the most famous name of us in that show. So they said, hey, listen, we're going to do this, uh, this, this, thing with these animals <laughs> introducing cartoons. You want to come and do that? He said, yeah, sure. And Donner was great for, for one thing in particular. And that was that when we did something funny, he would laugh uproariously, which he could do because the sound didn't matter. It was all just the visual. You know, the cameras were running. He had three cameras at, at a time, which was also smart. Um, it, mean the, it meant we had to do fewer takes. Uh, which was important because the, uh, I'll get into that. Anyway, the main thing Donner did was laugh. When we did something funny, he laughed uproariously. It was, a, it was, it really energized us. It didn't matter about the sound because indeed we were shooting three cameras that helped save us a lot because these costumes weighed about 40 or 50 pounds and they were made of, 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 uh, carpeting was the, what was on the outside. So we went through, uh, I don't know, 15 t-shirts a day sweating because it was so bloody hot. It was all you could do to run around out there for a couple minutes for literally two minutes and then get off camera, have somebody rip your, we could take off our own heads, but then somebody else had to unzip the bloody thing to let the cool air in. It was the hottest work anybody's ever done. They, at a certain point, I'm sure somebody did hotter work somewhere else uh, <laughs> in a nuclear facility, maybe. At a certain point, they talked to NASA 
and asked NASA to supply us something that might cool us. So they gave this, these things that were about, I don't know, six inches by three inches deep. The, the idea was to blow air across a, a frozen CO2 cartridge of some kind. And uh, the a hose would send the air up to your head and cool you. The only problem was you wore this thing at your kidney. Well, on a show where you spend half your time falling down, having a thing on your kidney is pretty much guaranteed to, to have <laughs> kidney damage. So, I imagine. but we wound up using them as kazoos. Right. right. Amazing. So, you know, I, I just want to say that I, I, I can only imagine. Well, actually, I can't imagine because I've been in similar, you know, um, situations with directors and I know for me as a voice actor when you're doing animation or you're reading a funny script or you know whatever the case is and when the director uh you know laughs hysterically at what you've done but not in a in a mocking way. I mean they genuinely yeah. think I yeah, mean yeah, you've yeah. nailed it that's brilliant that's amazing I have that experience often with a few of uh the directors I work with and and it, it is it's such wonderful and I can only imagine too especially for somebody who's you know fresh into college very young late teens yeah. early 20s yeah, yeah. how amazing how much validation that would have been for you at that yeah. moment you know to hear this big barrel laugh from Richard Donner yeah, that's, you know it's that's, amazing that that's exactly it then he was a, indeed he had a big laugh he wasn't some chuckler he was oh, oh, he, yeah all over the set you could hear it for weeks <laughs> For days, for for blocks. Incredible. Um, and then, of course, he goes on to become who who he well was then and and is now. I mean, and he's in, still he's still doing incredible. it. He's doing the next uh, installment of uh, Lethal Weapon. For he Christ is, sake. and I think he's the is fifth. he is he close to ninety now? Or he's I mean, ninety. Yeah, he's ninety. 90. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, he's still going. It's and of course he he directed arguably my favorite kid movie which is the goonies from uh 1985 so uh this is one that i missed i didn't i never saw the goonies you, you never saw <laughs> it's a great film i I think you know what i think even even today i think you could appreciate it i i think oh, so man. um okay so so you have the banana splits and you're in college and you're pursuing yeah. now what specifically were you was it just a uh, i mean it was USC's film course, but what was your goal? Did you want to direct? Did you want to write? Were you looking to produce all of the above? I don't think, I, I think the answer is all of the above. I yeah. didn't have a clear picture uh, uh, of what I wanted when I applied. And once I got there, I realized, oh, well, I got to be behind the camera saying, you know, look over here, look over there, put the camera here. And oh, you want to be directed then? Oh, is that it? That's what I want to be? Okay. Right. <laughs> So I, I, you know, I really didn't have a clue in the beginning, and um, you you figure it out very quickly. Right. Uh, you you make the first films class. You make five films, five or six. I don't quite remember. And if you do well enough, they send you to the next level. That's two ninety, and then if you're lucky, you get into three ten. Mm. And in three ten, when you're in two ninety, you're making five or six films. I forget which, by yourself, shooting it, cutting it, the whole schmear. And if you're lucky, you move on to 310. Now you're working with a crew. One guy's the writer, one guy's the director, whatever the heck, however you portion it out. And if you do well there, how many films do we make? We each made one film at 310. And if you do well there, you move on to 490. Now you have a crew of five and you make whatever film it is. The one that is Judson's release slash Foster's release release was actually we were finished with the undergraduate studies. 490 was done. There was one more course we could do, sort of. And we had this idea. I'll tell you how I got the idea in a second. We had this idea for this film, and we could get credit for it if we, you know, if we did whatever the hell. We were making uh, my 490 film called Wallflower about a guy who wants to be a rock and roller and uh, starring my brother, the one who'd been Flegel. <laughs> but he was really an actor, um, a good actor, a fine actor and a voiceover man, a guy who worked ahead of a, in his closet at home in the Valley, in the, in the San Fernando Valley, 
had a, a perfect uh, voice. What do you call it? A booth. A, a voice, voice booth. Yeah, a vocal booth. Yeah. Anyway, it was perfect. And uh, we were making my 490, and I was just waiting for the lighting to be done or whatever. And this guy, I was an actor. We were just standing there shooting the breeze. Baird Banner was his name. I have no idea if he ever became an actor or not. Said, did you ever hear the story about, and he described the premise of Judson's release to me. A woman's in a house, a girl's in a house alone. She's babysitting, the parents are gone. She gets these weird phone calls. It turns out he's in the house. I said, oh my God, that would make a great movie. And I said it to my partner. Uh, he's actually still my writing partner, a guy named Alec Lorimore. Though at the time he was Steve Lorimore, long story. His middle name was Alec. He decided it was more professional to go with Alec. So I said it to him and he said, well, yeah, why don't we make that as a film? So we made it as a film and here we are. Incredible. Now, now, what was this guy's name again that you were talking Baird, to? Baird Banner, B-A-I-R-D Banner. Baird, Baird Banner. Now, Baird, Baird Banner, wherever you are in the world, may be the <laughs> one responsible go. For this, you know, I mean, I know that, I mean, you know, obviously Black Christmas, uh, when a stranger calls is 79, Black Christmas is 74, um, you know, there's a short film that, that sort of is the catalyst for when a stranger calls, which is, I think a year or two earlier than that. Obviously there's an, the urban legend of the babysitter, yeah. the man upstairs has been around for uh, a while. It was around since I think the late fifties, early sixties or something. Um, and it was based on some, well, that kind of thing that there was yeah. a girl home alone, blah, blah, blah. But what's fascinating about this folks, in case you're just tuning in your, or you're watching after the fact, what's really interesting about this is that, and understandably so, I mean, they are in the pop culture, they're feature films they're you know, we understand why, uh, black Christmas gets the credit it does for instilling that trope. We understand why, you know, when a stranger calls gets, you know, the credit it does. But what's interesting is that Judson's release, AKA Foster's may very well, I don't know, unless there's something before that, may very well be the first film, albeit short, 14 minutes, student, USC, but it's still yeah. it's still there, to showcase this premise on cell celluloid, as they say. I mean, this, this, this right. might be the first. Yours might be the first. I think that's right. And yeah. I think uh -huh. that's why it's incredibly important because I don't think anybody knows that. Well, not anybody, but a lot of people don't know this. And understandably, I mean, you know, we get it right out of sight, out of mind, but it's so fascinating. And I have seen the movie, by the way. I was able to actually watch the thing in its, in its entirety. And, you know, there are... First of all, as I said to you in in the email, love the the use of light and shadow, the low key lighting. Uh, it, it's genuinely eerie. It's genuinely creepy. It's got a it's got an aesthetic to it. I mean, obviously it's sixteen millimeter. It, you know, it's got that aesthetic anyway. But it, but it looks really really good. And well, the okay. basic premise of it is, you know, you see a lot of the tropes that you do see in Halloween or When a Stranger Calls or Black Christmas. I mean, there's, you know, it's it's not very apparent, but it makes me wonder whether unconsciously or not, you know, I mean, because we all know that people are influenced by people all the time. And I tell you, man, it's there's some interesting things in that in that film. I mean, even the shots that you have, the still shots of the different locations with nobody in it. I mean, does that ring a bell to Halloween fans? And, and again, that's not to say that John Carpenter would have copied anything, right? It, it's all about being influenced. Filmmakers influencing each other, you know, generations influence other people. But it's, it's just interesting to see something that is so iconic in another place that could be its inception. And, and that's, well, and that's what's know, fascinating. John gave us notes on Halloween. He was a, you know, a classmate of ours. That's right. And of course, it stars Dan O'Bannon, and Carpenter and O'Bannon made Dark Star together. That's right. So John gave us notes on how we should edit it. In fact, I think mm. I think in the very first version, we didn't show the bad guy. We didn't show O'Bannon. And then he suggested, why don't you go ahead and show the guy and show what a miserable thing he is and how he's threatening this girl. Just, you know, so we went and shot Dan O'Bannon being a, Right. slithery right. son of a gun 
<clears throat> and uh, it improved the thing. And it gave us something to cut to, which before that, I don't really remember what it was like before we cut to the bad guy, but it improved it. So to John's credit, he waited quite a long time before he went ahead and did Halloween, which is basically the same movie. Uh, he gave us a chance to do something with it if we were going to. We didn't because we moved on to other things. Right. right. I don't know what. <laughs> uh, uh, nothing could be as big as Halloween. Anyway, to his credit, he gave us a chance to do something with it, even though we didn't. So fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it, and it's true. I mean, and, and, and then, of course, there's that, there's that, um, uh, now, John, I don't believe John, John, as if we're on first name basis, John Carpenter, uh, I don't believe has, uh, confirmed or denied this but but of course bob clark the director of black christmas uh has famously said that he was having a conversation with john carpenter in the in the mid to uh, maybe 75 76 somewhere around there and carpenter according to bob clark and I, I had said you know if you were to do a sequel to black christmas what would you do and bob clark said oh i don't know i don't really want to do a sequel but i don't know maybe he's uh, locked up for a year and he escapes on halloween night <laughs> <laughs> but really? even Bob Clark, yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah. Of course, Bob Clark passed away in in uh, 2007, unfortunately, in a in a um, car accident. But but even Bob Clark has said, but but hang on, I mean, you know, there's there's a big difference between you know that casual conversation and right. what right. eventually became Halloween. You know, right. he says right. you, you you can't just say oh, you know what I mean. Even Bob Clark acknowledges that. But again, if that conversation really did happen, there's that. I find those things fascinating about how filmmakers and artists who, who you respect and admire will often inspire each other. And sometimes you don't sure. even realize that you're doing it consciously. I think the director of My Bloody Valentine, if I'm not mistaken, although I stand to be corrected, had even said that there are similar things that he did with the main character that uh, in retrospect, he looked at years later and was like, wow, that's kind of like Billy a little bit in Black Christmas and he's like and I, I had no I didn't I wasn't thinking about that when I was doing it right. I wasn't right. you know maybe it was subconscious you know and, and some, of these uh, things that, some of these things inherently cross over yes I mean if you've got a guy who's going to run around with a knife and kill people there are certain character traits in human <laughs> beings they're going to cross there's no question that the same guy is going to be repeated that's it and there's only so much you can do <laughs> you know stay la vie that's a that's that's really cool. I appreciate you sharing that. That's amazing. Of course, Carpenter did the uh, uh, um, uh, the voy the um, voyeur film, which which I also saw, which was interesting. Oh right, right. Um, uh, Captain uh, Voyeur. Ca that's right. And uh, again, a lot of similar sort of things in there that you eventually see in Carpenter films. But Judson's release, aka Foster's release, um, is so it's so important, and and I hope that eventually. Um, it can be seen. It can be released and and seen by the general public. Uh, you know whether that's in the form of the of the film, of course, um, uh, shock value, which which uh, right. I had a chance to see, or or on its own. You know somehow. I, I I think what you did and what you guys did, of course, not knowing it, but it may be, it may be the first time that trope that theme yeah. has been seen on film. Unless there's something be. prior to it, I don't know. Fascinating. It might be, you know, that we were at the point of, it, it, when I was doing it, student filmmaking had sort of entered the universe as something as something new, right? As something extant. And before that, you know, there were there were the only short films that were made were educational films. In fact, the outfit we sold Foster's release to or Judson's release, whichever was an educational re releasing company. It's used as a in home economics classes to teach girls how to be careful in the house, I guess. I don't really know how it applies to home economics, but there you are. That's um, why Pyramid um, picked it up. And that's why the title changed from F Judson's release to Foster's release. They'd already done their catalog. And if we wanted to be in their catalog, which meant a lot more sales, we needed to change the name. So Judson's release was called that because O'Bannon, who was in the movie, listened to the music that Alec and I were playing. And he said, that sounds like I'm done by Blind Willie Judson. 
whoever the hell he's making that up right and we said well somehow you know when you do a bridge in a song that's also called a release a bridge is a release so it became judson's release that's why the name exists and it's why it changed it needed to fit in pyramids catalog Fat. So fascinating um now i did read that but of course you know the viewers would not ha have known that so thank you for sharing that as well that's 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 uh an important important information what's what's really interesting of course i didn't know where the title came from until this very right. moment right. and right. i always interpreted as that the guy's name was judson his last sure. name and sure. his it's his release he's released from some scummy prison or it, some it, institute it all, who's gone back to doing what he's done it's that it all sort of fit together that way. Yes. The reason it became Foster's in, a D, in, in addition to the fact that we wanted to fit in the catalog, we knew a couple of guys named Foster right. that we went to college with and it, it was just appropriate. It could have been, you know, Frenchie's release or I don't know. I can't even think of an, another F other than Foster at the moment. <laughs> Frank, Frank's release. I don't know. <laughs> Frank's release. No, there's nothing in that. Nothing. No, it just, it just sounds a little, uh, it sounds a little uh, satirical. Fairling Getty's, Fairling Getty's release. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The poet is out from, you know. That's it. Now, what, now when, when Foster's release or Judson's release, I should say, when, when it was completed and finished and, Tell me about where you showed it. How how was it graded? How was it marked? Uh, did it? What 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 did your fellow you know students think of it? What did John Carpenter think of it? Well, as I say, Carpenter gave us notes. The first version didn't have O'Bannon on the phone in the bedroom or wherever he is. He's deliberately amorphous because right. you don't want to give away where he is before we reveal where he is. Right. Right. Um, what was I starting to answer? Uh, oh, I had said, think? you know, we were actually not doing the in 490. You show your films to the entire class and people uh, give you feedback. Oh, my God. Those classes, those were those were brutal sessions, especially if O'Bannon was in them. He was the most acerbic uh, uh, commenter. Uh, boy, he'd let you know what he thought. And if he, anyway, <laughs> we survived those. That was where I did Wallflower. It survived that. Anyway, and we went on to do Foster's release or Judson's release, but that was not done under the circumstances of having people view it. So I don't have any idea what my fellow students thought. All I know is that we finished the film. We managed to get it into something. There used to be a film festival in LA called the Filmex film exposition so it ran there in 71 yeah 71 uh jesus that's 50 bloody years ago it is and, and count them holy catfish when did you I, shoot foster's really or judson's shot release. it in the summer whatever the what heck the name of it is uh <laughs> it was in the summer of 70 okay the summer of 1970 just we had just finished alec and i had just finished wallflower my sort of student thesis film whatever the heck it was that's when baird banner said did you ever hear this story da, 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 da. and we said ah let's move forward baird so banner. we shot it in 70 finished it in 71 my dad had a little studio in sunny in uh, santa clara up near the san francisco uh, bay area and he had a uh, he had a, a couple of cutting rooms and a moviola Steenbeck. You want to talk about Steenbeck's being uh, 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 dated? Uh, we had an upright moviola, which is a device you put the film in on the film, the pictures over here and the sounds over here, and you edit them together. My God, it's so archaic now when you think about how you can do it all here in the computer. Anyway, my dad had that. He had a couple of movieolas, a couple of cutting rooms, and he had a 16 millimeter blimped. No, it was not blimped. It was an industrial film camera that you could rent a blimp for, which is what we did. What was it? An Airy, an Airy M, I think it's called. It's very noisy unless you put the blimp on it. But once you do put the blimp on it, it looks like a you know a proper movie camera. It's a huge housing. And, right. and it works to quiet the damn thing. It was great. So we had that and we rented Dolly Track from probably, 
uh, some outfit in the city. It might have been Francis Coppola's outfit. Um, I don't remember. And uh, we shot it all around my parents' house in Sunnyvale, California, in six in 1970. And it looks like California. It. Sorry, <laughs> it looks like California. <laughs> oh, it, uh, yeah, for good reason. Yes. Uh, all that stuff with O'Bannon uh, uh, up in San Francisco on Potrero Hill—that's where it was. With gnarly neighborhood. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah. So yeah, the summer of '70 is when we shot it. Amazing, amazing. So, okay. Uh, what do I, what do I want to ask first? Okay. Uh, well, at was there any point in your? I mean, obviously, you've gone on to do other things, and 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 you know, you've left Judson's release behind, and. Naturally, why, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, at what point, or was there ever a point, and if there was, did you realize that Judson's release, a.k.a. Foster's, uh, may have uh, a certain level of importance to horror people, film people, in a, you know, in, in the sense of what, you know, I've, talked about here on the channel was there ever a point like that or is this just something that's new all of a sudden to you it's pretty new it's uh yeah this is all new i think it's great mind you but it is it's all quite new i never saw black christmas right i never saw uh i remember god the one about uh the one the fred walton one uh when a stranger calls when a stranger calls right which he did as a short and then he made it into a feature he did it smart we should have done that. Why did we didn't? I don't know. We've moved on to other things. <laughs> Laura Moore and I are still working together. In fact, we have a series we're, we're working on now. In fact, I'm instead of doing it, I'm talking to you. It's fun. <laughs> I, I, I'm allowed. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't actually start. We don't start our sessions until one o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, good, good, it gives, good. It gives me a chance to do all the other crap that I do. Around that's here. right. Well, last thing I want to do is take away your, you know, your time from that. Well, that's interesting, no, no. though. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and, I, but it, I, I think it's it's. I think it it is. I mean, again, uh, maybe not in a general sort of pop culture sense, but when you sort of niche it down to the horror subgenre and and especially that 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 theme of that you know person in the house on the phone, and you look at the two most iconic examples of that, Black Christmas and Stranger Calls, and all of a sudden there's this film that nobody knows about or you know, very yeah. little people do, and it's like, well, h hang on a sec here. This is. I think it's just if for. Nothing else. Uh, it's a good anecdotal sort of knowledge to have because yeah. the, the, and rightly so, and I understand it, you know, it's like, you know, rock and blues existed before Elvis, but it was Elvis that took it to the next level and, yeah. and, and yeah, made yeah. it sort of mainstream, right? Yeah. So, but we can't forget that Chuck Berry was around before Elvis Presley. So, um, right. but, you know, he's, but he's known as the king of rock and roll. Why? Well, because he took it and, you know, made it what it is. So it's not to say that Black Christmas and, you know, When a Stranger Calls are not important. They are, but... Judson's release. I mean, this is that's the that's the that's the OG uh, as far yeah. as we know. So that's that's yes. really fascinating. I, 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 I didn't think it was anything until Dino Everett started putting together that show, Shock Value. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Shock Value. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and uh, I think it's also written up in. It's a guy in New York, Jason Zeneman. I think he did something. Uh, wrote something about Judson's release. I could be wrong. Uh, he did some other anyway there are there are people who know these days yes <laughs> yeah well yeah and and dino is is great i've exchanged a few emails with right. him and and uh the work that he's done to to get it out there and of course the right. article he wrote for uh usc there on the on the website i i made a mistake when i did the show um a couple of weeks ago i thought the article was just from a couple of years ago it's actually from 2014 i'm <laughs> I'm really late to the party on that, but it's such a wonderful article. It dives deep into it, and it's just those things that, you know, it's, I think it's important to sort of, you know, appreciate maybe where things, I, it's it's interesting, you know, it's not interesting yeah. to everybody, but it's interesting to guys like, you know, like me and <laughs> uh, who appreciates that, that, that kind of stuff. So, 
Okay, so moving on from Judson's release and Foster's release, as much as I could sit here and talk about it all day, unless there's any other anecdotal stuff that you think is important. If it, if it occurs to me, I'll mention it. Sounds good. Okay. Um, you tell me your next steps. I mean, you leave USC and, and you move forward and, and what was sort of, what were you thinking? Where were you going? There, How do you get there, from there to the howling? There are no real guidelines when you, they, you know, the USC teaches you how to make a film on a practical level, right? But the camera over here had this kind of lighting, had the actor do, 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 do. nobody, but nobody teaches you how to take what you've learned and turn it into a career. You, you just, you know, you get out there and you stumble around. It's true. I went to work as an assistant editor for a guy that my dad, again, my dad knew. He had been an editor of, um, for Hanna-Barbera again, and he needed an assistant. So I was not a great assistant editor, but I could sync dailies and I could catalog things and I could work my way around the room fairly well. So I did that for a while. At the same time, I did that during the day, I was writing at night. Uh, it's just the way it is when you're 23 or four, you know, you, you have boundless amounts of energy and you put them to work in whatever way is going to forward your life. <laughs> it's true. So indeed I would write at night, uh, uh, sometimes alone, sometimes Alec, actually Alec and I always do a really thorough outline, uh, one to 40 or 42, whatever. Uh, of this happens and then this happens and then he'll take one to five i'll take six to ten and someone will checkerboard the thing which means it has to be pretty well really well detailed out because things have to make sense between among the checkers the checkers on the checkerboard so i would write at night edit during the day and uh eventually we wrote a script about a trucker that didn't go anywhere, but it was pretty well written, well written enough that we got people's attention. Uh, an agent could send it out. And uh, was it a uh, horror film it, or what kind of? No, a... it, was, it was just it was in the 70s. <laughs> Truckers suddenly became a big deal. There was a big truck strike. You won't remember. But in about 72, <laughs> it was a big truck strike. And. There was a, a movie called Convoy. For some reason, truckers were the thing. Right. I don't know why. Anyway, so we wrote a truck script about a an independent guy. Blah, I don't remember what happened. Anyway, it, it, got, us going. We, it got us going. What was it called? The Silver Bulldog, it was called, because the the a bulldog is the moniker, the, the mascot of Mack Trucks, the Silver Bulldog. So that got us going. And then we wrote one. The sting came out and the things about, you know, you have to go with the flow. You have to go with what the heck is out there, what people are thinking. And because the sting came out, we wound up writing a thing about, about uh, a guy, Evil Knievel was also a big deal. I'm sure you've heard of him. Oh, yes. We wrote a thing about a guy who wants to jump the Mississippi River on a motorcycle. <laughs> And the guy who hears about this and promotes this and the girl who's running away from the forced marriage. And it was called the Great Cape Girardeau Leap and Ray Stark optioned it, which was a big deal at the time. Hold on one second. Uh, no problem. Uh, take this pill. Otherwise, <laughs> my, otherwise my shoulder and my back will not be happy with me. It's important to my... Oh, Standing sure. If you need to do that, by all means. I'll be back in one second. Okay, uh, no problem. Sounds good. No, no, um, I'm, I'm, st I'm still here, brother. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Incoming waves, right? So yep. because this thing came out, we were able to write this thing set in the 30s about the guy who wants to jump the Mississippi and the guy who promotes his jump and the girl running away from the forced marriage all get together and barnstorm the Midwest. And we sold that to Ray Stark. Actually, he bought an option. That's the way it works. He gets, you know, gives you $10,000 down against 
the 125,000 is going to be when it gets made. Those numbers are out of the blue. I have no idea how much we got. It was more than that. <laughs> Even in 1975. Yeah. Um, and that was well enough received that people actually ripped off the some of the premise of it, some of the some of the subplots. We went to Tom Pollock. Tom Pollock was a huge uh, showbiz attorney until recently. He died recently. Great guy. And we went to him to see if we could sue because our plot was clearly ripped off for another movie. He said, no, after all, you, you don't want to sue Ray Stark. He's this huge producer in town. I mean, you could do it, but your name is going to be mud. So <laughs> we didn't do it. And uh, but, you know, the, there were great benefits from the script. It opened lots of other doors and uh, we kept going. Sometimes what that's what it's about, right? Is, is, you know, sometimes you think the thing that you think is your thing that's going to be the thing is actually just the thing that opens a door for the other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And anytime you can open a door, you yep. know, kick down a door, you're not really opening it in Hollywood. Everything's, you got to bloody kick it down. Yeah. Fascinating. So, um, okay. So, so, you know, you're writing your, you, you know, you've got ideas, you've got these scripts, you know, you're, you know, you got one that was optioned. You got lead me, lead me to, um, uh, to the howling where, where, I mean, obviously that's very early eighties, but, but, you know, so this is like 75, 76, what between that point and the howling was, were significant milestones that got you there? Oh, geez. I don't know. <laughs> the 70s. What, what did I do? I don't know, 70s? Dave. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me think. Uh, or you could just know, jump right I, to the howling if you want, if it's I just, easier. <laughs> I just kept writing. Lorimer and I kept writing. I also wrote with another pal of mine, John Yeager, and uh, I'll guide him to this when we're done. Great. And uh, he and I wrote a bunch of scripts together. Yeager would sit up on the edge of the chair. And uh, it's really funny. And, and I'd sit there, the, it was a typewriter. My God, a typewriter. I can't even imagine working on a typewriter anymore. But oh. there you go. Get to sit and uh, he would crack jokes at me and I'd write them down. I'd be laughing away and write them down. And next thing you know, you move on. Yeah. And so I wrote with him for a while. And then uh, the howling um, came about because... Alec and I had written a script called Vodun about voodoo. And uh, again, more doors opening and somebody at CBS liked and blah, blah, blah. We didn't mean to write anything for television, but there you are. Yep. It was written as a feature. And it was in the back of my friend Kevin Sellers' car. Kevin Sellers was an agent. His mom was a big producer, Arlene Sellers. For some reason, it was in the back of Kevin's car and Jack, Needed a ride home. Kevin gave Jack a ride home. And Jack said, oh, I find this script here in the back. You think it's okay if I read it? It was this voodoo script that Alec and I had done. And, and Kevin said, yeah, sure, read it. Turns out that Jack, this was a because we played baseball on Sundays in, in Mar Vista. Every Sunday, no matter what, on Christmas, didn't matter. We were out there playing softball. It was great fun because it was mostly because it was co-ed. It's California it was, too. Guys it would not be anywhere near as much fun because it was co-ed though. You, you, you work harder at it. And a lot of hundreds of people played in that game over the five or six years that it existed. And the more actresses and models we could get out there, the better it was, the better we played. It was great fun. And, and, you know, Kurt Russell played with us a couple of times and amazing. Somebody else famous, uh, lots of uh, Lauren Hutton. I don't know if you know who that is. I've heard She's the name ahead of your time, but uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I was a very fast runner, and um, she recognized me on the Paramount lot a couple of days later. And at the game, she called me Mercury, Mercury the runner. Oh. So at Paramount, a couple of days later, where Alec and I had an office, she said, "Hey, Mercury." Oh my God! It made not, made my day, made my life. I'm still talking about it. I, you are to this day. You're still talking about it. It made your life, Terrence. At, at any opportunity, <laughs> I will talk about Lauren Hutton. Going, hey, Mercury! Oh my God! What a what a, what a buzz! I can imagine. So I played softball there. Jack gave Kevin gave Jack a ride home. Jack sees the script. 
ah, Jack went to college with Mike Fennell. Mike Fennell was the producer of The Howling. They were looking for somebody to rewrite the script because they bought pretty much just the title. Uh, so they got me in there. They said, here's the book. The first thing we did was throw out the book. It was about a random girl who gets bit. Maybe it was a guy, I don't even remember, who gets bit and goes to a small town and stuff happens. So the first thing, as I say, we did was throw it out and start over again. And, uh, you know, I did my draft. It wasn't quite what they wanted. They brought in sales to do another draft on me. He used a lot of my stuff, apparently enough of my stuff that the Writers Guild said, yeah, this guy should get credit. So that's why, that's how the, the howling came about because I played softball. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the moral of the story. Uh, that's not the only Amazing. time uh, that a ball game has wound up helping my career. Um, my buddy also touch football. That also helps. <laughs> well, you know what? I think it, it, it probably has something to do with, there's probably a psychology around it, right? It's, it's also why uh, in business uh, you see a lot of people going to play golf you know, uh, yeah. because they're relaxed, they're, you know, maybe you have a drink or two, either, you know, after or whatever, and you're relaxed. At same, and At the same time, there's this sense of competition. Right. I mean, business is competitive. Showbiz is extremely competitive. Yep. And there's competition on the ball field, no matter how you slice it. Or That's the it. golf course. That's or it. the tennis court. Yeah, no, 100%. And there's, there's that yeah. camaraderie and that sense of connection that you make, you know, as a sense right. of sort of trust. Um, right. and, uh, if you can build that playing a, a, a competitive game, you know, you, you either, I think you learn very quickly in that kind of environment, you know, whether you like somebody or not, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That's so a, it's, that's uh, a true thing. yeah, I think that's, it's understandable, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily thinking of it consciously, but, but it's, right. it's, uh, it certainly helps for sure. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I haven't indeed. seen the howling in, in, oh, in years, but I remember watching it when I was young and, and digging it. I, I thought it was great. Uh, and right, obviously right. it's become sort of an iconic, uh, werewolf film in the genre. And, right. um, you know, it's, it's, it was uh, the, uh, the, 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 the effects on it were the, it was the first time that anybody had done those pneumatic damn good. effects, put the, the, the air blisters under the guy and have it do what it did. Yeah. <laughs> And it looks, it still looks good to this day. I mean, yeah, I yeah. love the practical effect look and, you know, whether it's American Werewolf in London or The Howling or whatnot, yeah. seeing that physical transformation, you know, yeah. uh, under the light and, you know, the nuance, you know, the, 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 the wet look and the, you know, everything. It's just, it's so, right. uh, there's a, you ultra know, slime. Oh That's yeah. And there's that a wet look, ultra slime. Yeah. And, you know, you know, we understand why obviously, you know, it, it's, it's transition to cg but it's it is unfortunate that although we are seeing a little bit of a resurgence of the practical effects it is unfortunate right. that uh we've lost the 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 the, the charm uh of 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 that because it's uh man there's something to be said about i mean you can i can see blood and guts and that's computer generated or some creature that's animated and and my mind automatically knows instinctually right. instantly I, I i'm not fearful of this it, it right. doesn't it doesn't right. look real it's not tangible it's not it looks synthetic it's not organic when you look at right. the howling or those types of, of 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 films back in the day i mean there's there's still a you know when you watch it even today there's still a it's oh it's weird it's creepy yeah you know yeah, yeah, and because yeah. uh, it looks you know it's organic it was actually in the space it's actually in the space under right. that light being shot yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's actually that's a big the howling is a great example of using light and shadow and everything very well. Um, what's his name? Hora shot that. What's his first name? I can't remember. The Dave, direct? I need uh, I need another minute and a half. Yeah. No. By all means. Uh, I, I'm an old guy. Yeah. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Take your time. <laughs> take your time. Isn't that amazing, folks? Uh, talking about. Um, Judson's release and Foster's or AKA Foster's release. It's, it's fascinating to be able to understand, you know, that's why these things are so important because, you know, without the internet today and without articles from Dino over at USC and, and without, you know, we, we, and you know, whoever else, 
comes along to talk about it, we wouldn't know. You know, we would think, and it's again, it's not to take anything away from Black Christmas, When a Stranger Calls. Those are important films, right? Those are, you know, that's very important and they deserve all the praise that they get 100%. You don't take anything away from that. But it's fascinating that if you, you know, where did they come from? Where does it, you know, and it's like, you know, his friend Baird there, what? Where did he, I'd love to be able to talk to him. And, you know, you, you, you know, you sort of go down this rabbit hole of, of how did he discover? Where, did he hear it from somebody who heard it from somebody? Which is obviously always the case. Um, but it goes to show you that, you know, like I always tell you, right? You hear me say a lot that there are no original stories uh, to a degree. There's just different ways to tell them. You know, we often think what is original actually comes from something else. So it's fascinating and uh, uh, to, to hear all that kind of stuff um, and, and where it came from. And of course, John Carpenter had a hand in that. And then when you, look, when you watch the film and you, you do see a little bit of Carpenterisms in there, which you later notice in terms of his themes and his tropes that he applies to other films as well. So uh, fascinating stuff indeed. Welcome back. Welcome Thank back. You. You're back. <laughs> I am. I am so, back. Um, now the howling was was a, a fairly moderate success if if I'm not mistaken. I think it was was I it think not? That's right. Yeah, yeah, I think it was it wasn't I, a, a a blockbuster or anything, but I mean it was it, it was all right if if I'm not mistaken. It was a modestly priced. I think it was a couple million bucks and it did quite well. Yeah. Yeah, let me just see here. I actually I think I can bring this up fairly quickly. Uh the howling box office according to box office mojo, which is sort of the the right. standard. So it was, it grossed uh, domestic and worldwide the same thing. So obviously it was probably just released in, in North America. Uh, 17, it grossed $17,985,893. So $17 million. And its budget, according to Wikipedia, was $1.5 million. So... Yeah. yeah, a modest success, for sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And directed by Joe Dante. Which right. is uh, which is interesting. Um, very cool indeed, and of course stars D. Wallace, who who made her name, uh, of course you know E. T. and 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 yeah. uh, I believe she was in Cujo, if I'm not mistaken, as well. She has a, she had a reign of horror films there uh, as well. Right. Um, so after the Howling, now what was your thought when when you you got the credit that you deserved in being a co-writer on the film how did this help your career what what direction did your career go in from there i don't know that there was any direct impact on my career it was nice to know that there was a, a movie with my with my name on it up there and, and that you know always legitimizes you in a way that's it's sort of ephemeral. Nobody says, ah, now that you have a screen credit, X can happen. Right, right. But, you know, it gives you sort of bona fides in a way after that. Uh, yeah, I've got a screen credit. And, and my buddy Clay Froman and I uh, used to go out and have sushi. We would always toast to credits. Here's to credits. And uh, I, I've got some and uh, he's got some now. So I imagine if we get together again the next time we do, Here's to more credits. Here's to, that's right. That's right. Here's to having got credits. Um, okay, so so let's make a leap then. So let let's go. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're continuing to work throughout the '80s. You know, you're dabbling in this. You're doing that. You got the howling under your belt. How do we get to Power Rangers? How do we get to Power Rangers? That's right, folks. For those of you that don't know, Terrence uh, directed quite a few episodes of the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. A little, again, I was sort of, it was a little after me or, uh, yeah, I was, I was about 15 or whatever. But how, how, how did we, we get to there? Because although it's well, not, I mean, it's a, it's a pop culture icon, the Power Rangers are in, yeah. in its genre of, of kids TV. Of of all of the stuff I've done, and it's a fair amount of stuff, the TV and the movies now, that is the single thing that everybody knows. Everybody, <laughs> I can talk about all the other movies I've done, all the other TV, whatever, but the many is the Power Rangers. Oh my God, you did the Power Rangers. Yes, but, but in order to get there, I have to go through two other things. By all means. I was pretty, I was pretty late to the directing game. I was 39 when I got my first gig. And that was called The Nest. And they were interviewing my agent, my late agent, Pete Turner, to his great credit, sent my uh, short film, Foster's Release, Judson's Release, whatever the name of it is, 
over to Julie Corman, who wanted to hire a first timer, not only to pay him less than they'd have to pay an experienced director, but also because she and her husband, Roger, were very much into giving first timers a chance. So Pete sent my movie over there. She interviewed me and it came down to me and one other, one other guy, a very good guy named Jeff Delman. <clears throat> and the only reason I got it was that I was more enthusiastic about shooting a cockroach movie <clears throat> than Jeff was. Cockroaches, yeah, man, the things that I can do with that movie, what? <clears throat> I did have a lot of ideas. I don't know that I had them all by the time I had that meeting, but I did a bunch of creative stuff with it. Uh, I, I, for one thing, one of the things I learned from Joe Dante was, if you've got this horror movie, make it funny. <clears throat> Try to find ways to, you know, lighten the load, lighten your own load by making it funny. <clears throat> Joe was always doing that on The Howling. One of the things we did on The Howling was all the characters' names are the names of directors of horror films. If you if you ever noticed, as, uh, as, I uh, haven't, but I am going to go back and have a look. Now, yes, <laughs> I will indeed. now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, anyway, so the lesson from that for me was find ways to make funny. So uh, cockroach movie, sure, we can make that funny. Uh, and indeed, there's a bunch of funny stuff in it. There's some unintentional laughs. There's a scene late in the story once everything has gone to hell. The sheriff has to draw his gun to go into the, the diner. And by this point of the movie, the audience knows that the cockroaches are wreaking hell, but the sheriff doesn't know that. So inherently he has to draw his gun. Well, the audience laughed at that, is unintentional laugh. He's going, he's going to shoot all these thousands of roaches, but he doesn't know. And, oh, what guy doesn't know? That was uh, is interesting. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that was fun. There was a, a huge, as you might imagine, huge learning curve. Oh yeah. As I say, I got to the game late. I was 39 when I directed The Nest. This is a young man's game. You should do this when you're 25, not 39. But I was busy making a living and whatever the hell else between the time I was 24 and 39. Uh, so it was a huge, huge learning curve. It was great fun. I had two editors on it who managed to take stuff, managed to salvage stuff that wasn't in, in, if you look at the nest, there's a scene where the girl who runs the diner is being attacked by all these bugs. And I shot it sort of straight, but the editor said, we can't do anything with this. Let's try this. So they took it and they just made it really snappy. There were two editors. One of the guys was a guy I played softball with. I hired him because we played softball together. See, Kids. that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> got to play softball. <laughs> uh, when the pandemic ends, play softball. That's it. Um, um, so they took that scene that I'd played straight and they cut it really fast. And it saved it. And I put La Cucaracha behind it. La Cucaracha. <laughs> you cannot find an extant version of La Cucaracha. So I went down to my, the guy who ran my gas station, who fixed my car with every Mexican guy. He gave me the, the words to La Cucaracha. Ya no puede caminar. <laughs> and my brother and I, and the guy who did the music for that film, Rick Conrad, recorded it. We recorded a new version of La Cucaracha. Put that behind the action really fast in that scene and it just people loved it people loved it amazing and it so it, it saved it so as i say huge learning curve on the nest my i remember i got that film they called me up and said this is here's a formal offer and i was terrified i called up my brother my oldest brother in albuquerque nelson and said they're gonna give me this film what do i do he says well do you have to shoot it no i don't have to shoot do you have to run the sound no do you have to act in it? No. So all you have to do is figure out where to put the camera and tell the actors what to do. And then when he reduced it to that. Such a simplified way of saying uh, it. So if I do a shot list, just draw it out, do the shot list based on, so I still do. Uh, I can't draw very well, but I can make diagrams that tell me what the camera's doing all the time. And I do this on everything I do. I do the storyboards that are worthless, but... From them, I can make shot lists, and the shot lists tell me how to shoot the bloody thing. I shot started lists off are incredibly important. Sorry? 
I said, shot lists are incredibly important. And, incredibly uh, important. Yeah. I started off doing handwritten shot lists, but my AD couldn't read them, so I started printing them up. By the time I got to Pacific Blue, that was a guy named John Shear, great right. guy. Uh, uh, he, um, he recently was victimized by the bloody uh, pandemic. Oh, that's um, unfortunate. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. But he said, I can't read these. Be sure to print them up. So I started doing that. So now I take my terrible little drawings, put them into real shot lists on the computer, and I'm off and running. Anyway, I did that on The Nest, and then I did Blood Fist. Oh, hey, Blood Fist was shot in the Philippines. Roger was, Roger's big on, Roger Corman is big on making movies anywhere where he can get a deal. And he could get a great deal in the Philippines because he knew a guy there named uh, Sirio Santiago, who was uh, brilliant at uh, getting people to work for not very much money, which is inherently true about the Philippines anyway. I had a six week schedule. I think I had an eight week schedule with it. No, I don't remember quite. Uh, I had a lot of um, paraphernalia I had access to. However, some of the paraphernalia was from the 40s because Serio had inherited a studio from his dad and the camera I had was a blimped Mitchell from 1946. Well, when you go to do the scene on the volcano, somebody has to carry this blimped Mitchell up the bloody volcano. It was <laughs> the guy, it, it's such a huge event that the guy actually gets a credit on the screen as camera carrier or something like that. <laughs> it was, that was so eventful. Um, the helicopter we had for only, you know, an hour or something, and it lands, it can't turn off its engine because it can't start up again. It needs to wait a long time. And you have to buy it by the hour. So we landed, my DP stays in the helicopter and the person who's in the best shape has to get out of the helicopter, run across the volcano, be careful not to fall in because it's a live volcano after of course. all. Be careful where you step because you don't want to get lava on your foot. And to run over to the actor, Don the Dragon Wilson, and tell him what to do and then run back and now the helicopter can take off again. It was- And hope that he does it correctly or you'll have to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of latitude when you're just flying above him and going in circles around that's him true. as he as he jogs around the rim of this bloody live, as I say, that's volcano, a good point. Which went off recently. It's Taal Volcano, about I don't know, 40 miles west of Manila, south anyway, wow. outside of Manila, which was I won't go into all the other stories I could about shooting in Manila in 1989. I think I can't go back to the country. <laughs> that's what another guy told me another producer uh, told me uh, when it was all said and done yes um, uh, anyway uh, indeed there was the nest that was great fun there was blood fist and that uh, for some reason there was a big gap Tom Calloway was shooting something out in the valley and he the guy he, he shot my fourth movie fifth movie anyway i ran into him he said yeah we're doing this stuff out in the valley called the power rangers they keep changing directors every week they can't find anybody to go on an ongoing basis so i sent them my material actually they were shooting quite close by anyway they liked my material i went in and met the guys they were great guys jonathan zahor in particular great guy and i wound up directing it for uh uh, what, five years? Uh, a long time, more longer than I should have until the next excellent opportunity came along. It was great fun. It was great fun. Uh, the most fun was shooting with Balk and Skull. Balk and Skull were the two juvenile delinquent kids in the school that, uh, but Paul uh, Schreier and Jason Narvey just had me in stitches every week. There was one time, Paul's a great big kid, and he was wearing this sort of uh, a gentleman's outfit. And he's supposed to have, it's supposed to be tea time or whatever. He had managed to sneak an entire steaming pot of 
tea under his jacket. <laughs> it, this had me on the floor. There was a the guy who was the DP of that, Alan Rosenberg, and I were constantly breaking up. We had to leave the camera. We had to leave the room because Bulk and Skull were too funny. Anyway, it was great fun making the Power Rangers. I did that for I don't know how many episodes. And indeed, as I say, no matter how many things I've done other than that, when I say Power Rangers, people go, oh my God, the Power Rangers. Yeah, it was great fun. It's funny because what I, what I, uh, I mean, obviously we connected over Judson's release and, right. and, and uh, when I went to your IMDb page and I, I, I looked and I looked and I, I was like, oh yes, yes, yes. The Power Rangers stood out to me not because I, I was a, a fan. Again, it was just a little after me, um, but because it, it has become so iconic in, in its, right. you know, in its own right, in terms of pop culture. And I know that a lot of my viewers are younger, so they'll, they'll probably be like, oh my God, the Power Rangers, that's amazing. You know, <laughs> like you say, right? So, but yeah. you know what? I mean, it's, it is, it, it's something to be proud of. I mean, to, to, to have that uh, credit, uh, to cheers to that credit, as you say, and, and, uh, um, it's a, you know, certainly it, 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 you know, and you never know, you know, if something is going to stick or is going to resonate with, you know, with fans. Um, but certainly it's, know, it's lasting. I didn't know, how, I didn't know how big it was until one day the Power Rangers are doing some kind of live, they had a live performance thing that they did and they were doing it at the, uh, Universal Amphitheater, which was, you know, over there where Universal Studios is in yeah. North yeah. Hollywood. And the traffic on the Hollywood freeway was backed up forever, for miles. Luckily for me, I was going the opposite direction when I saw that traffic. And I went, oh, that's the traffic for the Power Rangers performance. My God, it goes on forever. I understood in that moment how big it was. Wow. Of course, wow. Is, and that was in 93. It's a couple of minutes ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was indeed. It was massive. And then some of them went on to have, you know, other careers. And one kid that I, I, I did hire again for other movies, David Yost, good guy, good actor. Uh, Amy Jo Johnson, of course, went on to do other things. She did. Career. She did a uh, series up here. Um, yeah. Well, you're up here now, too. But uh, over here, I should say, in Toronto, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, called Flashpoint. And, yes, uh, I, I, yes, I, I saw a couple. Of episodes yeah, she was on that, that for. I, I thought actually that, that was a great show. She played a cop, right? She did. Yeah, she was uh, Toronto. Uh, well, no, it was Toronto. I believe it was supposed to be Toronto, or was it supposed to be some? It's funny. I, I think it was nondescript. It's that thing that you know we tend to do here. We we tend to make it more marketable. Sec, Dave. Yep. Yep. Hold no, on one sec. Yep, Hold nope. on one sec. Okay. No problem. No problem. No problem later. at all. Uh, da, da. Dave Bob Petway says I'm 34 and still practice my Power Rangers move in the basement. Moves in the basement. That's good. Good job, Dave. I'm I'm glad you do that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Dave, I'm moving locations. Okay, sounds good. You can see my entire house. <laughs> All righty. If I aim the camera this way, uh, one second, be able to see the poster. Did I lose it? Oh, I can kind of. Is it behind you there, or did you just show it? Or hold on a minute, I'll get. There. I lost a picture of you. Oh, I should be. I uh... Attending Zoom. You're still live. We're still good. Connection is good. I don't see. I don't see where it is. <laughs> is it part of? It's not part of Facebook. Um, post post attendee Zoom. Do you have your Zoom open? It. You should be able to see. You can still see me. Is that I right? can still see you. You're li We're live. You look good. Everything's great. I can't see you. I don't know why. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You'll be able to see this. That's right. Shock value, the movie. There it is. That's right. That's the movie that I was, uh, that Dino was very, very kind to let me view. And uh, are the participants in alphabetical order. <laughs> yes, I can see it up there. Amazing. Amazing. Great, great film. Great film. Great. I mean, it was so cool to, to, to see everybody's uh, films, you know, and, and uh, in there. I, I quite enjoyed the, um, uh, the Demon as well. I thought that was good. A very, uh, some nice vibes in there of um, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, you could was really that feel Charles that. Charles Adair's film? 
I think it must have been. So. I don't think it was John's. It wasn't me or no, it wasn't Carpenter, and it wasn't you. It might have been Dan. I don't know. Uh, you know what? I don't see why I can't see you here. No, oh, I don't know why. Um, do you have? A, is there a spot on your laptop there where you see the Zoom? It's like a little says, blue logo. It with says the... post attendee dash Zoom. Oh. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea. I. <laughs> But you're live and everything Neither looks good. All right. Oh, wait a sec. What the heck? On, you've... That's all right. It doesn't matter if I see you. I know what you look like. Right. Exactly. Uh, one second here. There you are. You're yeah. You're live. Everything's good. You know what I look like. So uh, we'll we'll try and and <laughs> and get that back uh, you know, after we're done. It, the visual is very important, though. You can't tell if your jokes are landing if you can't see somebody. <laughs> That's all right. I'll, but you can I'll hear survive. me though. I'll, I'll let it alone. I'll let's find the way it is. Okay. All right. Um, so we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, the power Rangers, of course. And, and, um, uh, Amy Jo Johnson, I think her name is, and how she was up here doing right. flashpoint and whatnot. Um, which is a, a Canadian show about the Toronto SWAT team, I guess. Um, and whatnot. It was quite good. Um, so Power Rangers, of course, is is a is a moment in your career. Let's talk a bit about after Power Rangers. Where where are you now? I mean, what's 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 what do you have going on now? You know, where are you in your career? Do you feel and what are some of your most, you know, when you look back at your career, uh, what are some things that you're most proud of? I mean, maybe even some things you haven't even discussed here today yet. Um the uh, actually the thing I'm single most proud of. Let me find it somewhere on this desk. Oh, we got props. This is good. There it is. Uh, this is a movie that my wife and I wrote in about I don't know in a couple of weeks. Twice as and, dead. Uh, could you you could read that right? Yeah, twice as dead. Yep, and there's the uh, what it looks like when it's this way. It's uh it's basically um, um what do you call it? Uh, Who's afraid of Virginia Wolf? meets Duel in the Sun. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, of course, was about the husband and wife who argue through the entire play. It's in a play by Edward Albee. Uh, with, uh, and when, then, when Michael Nichols made the movie, he used uh, Burton and Taylor, you know, Elizabeth Burton, and your audience has no idea what I'm talking about. Oh, some um, might. Some I'll tell you right now, might, there's, yeah. there, there's some pretty... Anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great <laughs> movie, and it got Mike Nichols going as a director. And uh, though maybe the graduate was before that, I'm not sure. Anyway, we wrote a, a version of that, Twice as Dead, is about the husband and wife who robbed a bank, succeed at robbing the bank, but fail at their escape. Because the guy they've hired to get them their fake passports goes after the money and goes after the wife. Very so, cool. And, uh, and this is a feature film, correct? Yes, we wrote it in a, in a, a matter of weeks because we were sort of inspired. I don't know what inspired us, partly because we'd seen uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, I guess, and we'd seen Duel in the Sun. Anyway, it didn't it didn't go anywhere with the with the real world, but we ran into a couple of guys, Richard Jeffries and uh, Rick Conrad, who wanted to make a non-studio film. Well, you can't get a more non-studio film than Twice as Dead about this couple who all they do is argue with each other and fail because of the nature of their relationship, fail at the getaway. Right. Into that, we uh, in, into that you add the the good looking guy who supplied their their uh, uh, passports and you're off and running into a bizarre kind of film anyway. In, in, in many ways, it's the one I'm most proud of because, as I say, we didn't have any studio support of any kind. We went out and shot it on our own money in Death Valley in June. Not something I recommend. We tried to get it going before that. It just didn't quite ever work out. So it got up to 128 degrees on the, the Cadillac El Dorado's uh, thermometer that we had. And... Uh, uh, it isn't just because we survived the heat that I'm proud of us. It's because the film works very well for what it was. We shot it on three, three chip digital, two cameras uh, at all times and, you know, hire a sound man. And he, the thing, the thing looks great and plays great. 
Now, is, is this very, is this available to to rent somewhere or? It's. You think? I don't know if it's still on Amazon. It was. Okay. It's put out by um, Push. Is the name of the company that released it. Some guys I knew at the the Corman Works. Uh, what are the Mike Elliott and um, I can't remember the rich uh, the the other guy at the moment. Anyway, Push Entertainment. What okay. Is it called? Let me look if it's on this thing. It sounds. I I love the premise yeah. and I I love the idea that it, I love the uh, knowing the simplicity. Uh, you know how how long it took you to write it, the simplicity and the nature of the production. I, I, I like knowing that kind of stuff. You know, the film nerd in me loves that kind of thing. And, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, knowing that you gain a, you know, a better appreciation as well of, you know, of certain things. So, well, it's, it's an amusing rap, so to speak. It's called, uh, it's put out by Vena distribution, wherever the hell they are. Let me see. Garden Grove, California. Um, and I say, as I say, I think it was on Amazon. I'm not sure now. Okay. It's quite a while ago, come to think of it. We shot it in 2001. Yes, right before 9-11. Uh, and uh, anyway, there you are. That's the thing I'm most proud of. <laughs> Twice as day. I think, I think that's great, you know, and, and, it, and it's a, and it makes sense in some ways too, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if it's right to say that it's a personal project, but it, the, there's an extra personalness to it because, you know, there's, it, it mean because you wrote it with your wife, you know, yes, and, indeed. and it's, yeah. so there's that, there's that emotional kind of, um, you know, attachment to it that, that is, that can be more meaningful than, than something that's, that's not, there's a, there's a, there's more layers of appreciation for you and your wife in yes, a film indeed. like that than to the average audience. You know, and yeah, that's, and I, I wouldn't say I get that there's it. anything personal, for example, in Blood Fist. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, the kickboxer enters the, you know, it was sort of a ripoff of uh, what, Blood, uh, what's the one with Jean Claude Van Damme? Blood Dan, Sport. The one that started it all. Blood Sport. Blood Sport, thank you. Because he did that, Roger said, why don't I do something called Blood Fist? Right. Yeah, it turns out I was the second director on that. The first one had to bail out. And it, it was a it was a lucky uh, I don't know a lucky set of events because at a certain point after Roger put it out into the theaters he walked up to me in the hallway at New Horizons and said this is our most successful film ever he was very happy <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah, I agree I mean that's that's amazing you know that's yeah, that's yeah, great yeah. Uh, listen we only got about 10 minutes left here and I'd like to just kind of go over to the chat room and and see if anybody has any questions for Terrence anything at all in regards to uh, his time at USC or Judson's release or uh, Power Rangers <laughs> or or uh, the howling or anything you want to ask or maybe just about the business I mean you know he's uh, worked in the in the business much longer than I have and 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 has uh, obviously uh, experience uh, in areas that I don't have. So here's an opportunity to uh, ask any questions that you may have uh, if you want to do that. Uh, I'll let uh, the chat room mull over that for a moment. Um, do you think that the... Here's a question for you. The, the, the industry as a whole... How do you, I mean, you know, you don't have to get too personal with it because obviously you're, you know, still working in the industry. So I don't want to say anything that's, that's, that, that's too negative. But I mean, how do you feel about the industry as a whole, where it's been, where it's come from, where it's going? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Um, uh, there was a show uh, in the 50s. My dad listened to a lot of uh, Broadway shows and, uh, and there was one, I forget which show it was, but the only reason I know this concept is there was a song in one of them called The Theater is Dying, The Theater is Dying, The Theater is Practically Dead. Mm. Movie business and the theater are always dying all the time when they're not really, they're just transitioning. Right. Um, the, you know, they'll be back. I, I must say I'm not, enthusiastic about movies I see lately. All of them are superhero films. 
I don't, the only one I've ever seen is the one with Downey. Uh, I like those. I think he's good. Iron Man, uh, I believe, yeah. What is it? Iron Man? Iron Man. I yeah. like the Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man movies. Right. Other than that, I have never seen, I take it back, I did like also uh, the chick. <laughs> Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman, thank you. There you go. <laughs> not number two. I couldn't watch number two. It was just a waste of energy it's funny they i tried to make they made it too big man. yeah i um i'm not a i tell my subscribers here on the channel all the time i'm i'm not a big superhero fan I, and i say that not saying that i'm not a superhero fan i just didn't i do uh, you know as a kid i wasn't into the comics or the toys or i grew up you know with other things and i mean i like batman and superman who doesn't i mean they're sort of kind of the staples of the right. of right. uh of the genre but i too i think i've only seen about two of the marvel movies and i you know and everyone's like you gotta watch them on i'm like yeah but now there's 22 of them i have to catch up on i don't have time for that <laughs> i yeah, should have started yeah, 10 yeah, years ago you know, um, anyway, we have a few questions here. Uh, one from Frank Riker, who's uh, a moderator here on the channel, says, Mr. Winkless, what genre is the hardest to write or direct? Comedy. Comedy. I would agree I, with that. I did. I did one comedy. Uh, my third movie uh, was a quote comedy <laughs> about sex in the office place. It's called Corporate Affairs. Oh, that's and a good title. <laughs> I, well, the, the title was good. Uh, the movie was not. I learned from that that I'm witty, but I am not funny. It's a huge gulf between witty, cracking up your friends across a couple of drinks, and d d you know, telling an audience to laugh. My God, yeah. comedy is brutal. And I yeah. really yeah. admire people to do it, and I wish I could. <laughs> well, and there's all like, you know, comedy isn't as universal as you know horror is i mean we're we're right. all generally afraid of the same things i mean there i mean yeah. there's it's nuanced some things i mean some people are afraid of bugs some aren't but in a general sense we all fear sort of the same thing which is classically and traditionally a sense of the unknown you know death all that kind of stuff uh right. and that tends to be more universal in terms of, of theme so it's always easier it, not easy but easier to write whereas comedy there's so many different types of comedy you know yeah, and, and i guess that's part of it indeed yeah uh, um mostly it's just difficult to set up a joke and make it connect it's true I, 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 as i say i i'm witty i'm not funny <laughs> I laughed. I think it's funny. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Chester Franklin Jr. says, Mr. Winkless, have you seen John Carpenter's Halloween? Sure. Yeah, I think everybody John has. John had, a, John had a lot of notes on uh, uh, Judson's release. And to his credit, as I said earlier, he waited four or five years before he made Halloween, giving us a chance to do something with it that we never did. So yeah, of course I've seen Halloween, and of course uh, Judson's release influenced uh, Halloween. But indeed, as I say, the third time he waited, we could have done something with it. We didn't. Yeah, well, he did uh, Salt on Precinct 13 first, and of course it was Irwin Yablons who came to him and said, "I want to do this little horror movie," and and right. uh, and then the rest is history, kind of thing. And right. and uh, right. oh yeah, there's lots of inspiration. I mean, I mean, I get inspired too. I mean, there in in our film that we just shot, you know, the Black Christmas tribute film. I mean, you know, there's things in there that that are our own, but certainly you right. can you can feel the inspiration, you know, and right. and uh, and I think I think that's sort of what is is great as long as it's not you know, you know direct plagiarism and copying i think being right. inspired by people and making it your own i think is is sort of what keeps the industry going in yeah, a lot of ways sure. yeah you know yeah. uh jonathan There's ball also something, oh, sorry go ahead go ahead it, it, it's an odd thing but it, ideas all seem to be out the in the air at once right and it's not uncommon for people to come up with an idea over here and another pe set of people over here and they didn't rip each other off they don't know each other ideas get out there because well we're all in this thing called the world and things are happening we all identify in basically the same way with what's going on in the world hundred hundred percent i couldn't agree with you more simplify terribly but there you are. but it's i get it i i couldn't agree with you more and you know i've i've learned a lot over the last number of years on on how things are you know again as i said earlier how how we we sort of make decisions we may not even be aware of it 
you know, consciously of some of the things that we do or why we do it or why we're right. drawn to it. And then when it's brought to our conscious mind, we were kind of like, oh my God, I guess I was, or I guess I didn't even realize it, you know? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Jonathan Ball says, question, how did it feel when The Howling premiered? Also, what part of the script did you handle? Well, that's a little hard to say what I handled. The entire, the entire setup script, of the yeah. girl gets uh you know attacked in the booth and all of that stuff as i said we threw out the book and right. started over again and again this is a time in which stories about reporters were sort of the happening thing in 1979 1980 whatever it was um so that became something that she did after we threw out the book i don't even remember in the book who it was that it was attacked doesn't matter how did it feel it was bloody unbelievably great I to bet. see the stuff that i did appear on the screen uh having tried for a whole bunch of years to get it there it was a great great buzz i bet i bet that feeling must have been euphoric you know what i mean yes, just so absolutely. so you, 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 euphoric is the word yeah it, it's sort of validation you know that you know you've worked yes. hard you've had doors open some led nowhere some close as as it is in you know the business i mean that's i can't tell you how many times i thought this is it and no not it <laughs> Yeah. And uh and it must it be was, it was incredible. It was another eight years before I finally directed something. So th it was yes, indeed validation it was. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. Uh let me see here. We got uh, da, 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 da. Evil Alex. Evil Alex says, What were your favorite films from your childhood that inspired you to be making movies? Into making oh, movies. Oh my god, that's really impossible. Uh it's a tough, I it's a, loved, it's a loaded question. Uh, I loved, uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> Forbidden Planet, I loved. I also loved The Time Machine, yes. the, the first one. Obviously the first one. You know, I think they both involved George Pal, I think. In, though, in fact, The Forbidden Planet, this is an interesting connection. Uh, the monster was animated by Hanna-Barbera. And years later, when Alec and I had a gig at Paramount writing the Jetsons, uh, we wanted the George Jetson character to, I think our premise was that he goes through some process where his abilities are advanced and he grows huge or right. something like right. that. I don't really quite remember, it's quite a while ago. And, and we were comparing it to, oh yeah, it was Jetsons. And we were comparing it to the way that the monster got big in Forbidden Planet. And inherently, because it was the Jetsons, we met with Joe Barbera, whom I had known, of course, from being the Banana Split. And we were able to touch base on that. And he asked after my dad, which was very nice. He was still alive at the time. And he, he pointed out that they did the animation for Forbidden Planet. Blew my mind. Amazing. Remember when they shoot at the monster? The premise of that movie is based on the, um, what is it? It's the uh, the Shakespeare play, the, um, I can't remember right now. I'm sure your viewers will know. It's about the guy's id coming out into the world. Right. Uh, why can it, oh, anyway, I don't remember. His, when his id appears, they shoot at it. His id appears because the daughter is leaving the father. It's wonderfully complicated, right? But it's but it's got but it's got a lot of metaphorical layers there too. It's yeah, it's a great film. And the other one I loved as a kid was, uh, as I say, Time Machine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I just dug the whole idea of going back in time and seeing all these different things happen. And of course, the beautiful uh, Yvette Mimieu is in that movie. Right. Years later, I would rent a house in Hollywood that she owned. I never had the opportunity to meet her. Damn it. But there you are. <laughs> but you did get Mercury. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, you, you that's can't right. get any better than that's that right. as far as I'm concerned. Well, well done. Well remembered, Dave. Well, you know, I mean, I think back to what I was a teenager and if Jennifer Love Hewitt, the actress Jennifer Love Hewitt had said, yeah, hi, Dave, to me, I think I, I wouldn't have forgotten there that either. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would have been the end. I, I think I could have retired right there. 
Uh, let me see here. Just a minute or so left. Uh, Frank Riker again says, oh, no, wait. Uh, well, I want to get Frank's, but I want to get somebody else. Uh, da, 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 da. Troy Grubb says, Mr. Winkless, what project TV show or movies that you have done did you enjoy working on the most? Probably Pacific Blue uh, mm. was the greatest fun. I, I lived at the beach. Pacific Blue shot at the beach. I could drive over my uh, my 300ZX with the top down and be there in two minutes. It was, right. it was fantastic. But also, it was a great crew. It was a great cast. It was great fun. It, uh, it, we had a lot of fun on that. It was more fun. It was actually, you know, the same show. It was five cops, you know, arresting people and crap like that. It was really just the Power Rangers, except adults also arresting. You know, there were five of them or six of them, depending Right. And uh, it was great, great fun. The power, uh, yeah, Pacific Blue. Amazing. Uh, Ryan Olshow, am I saying that correctly? Olsh, Olshow, Olshow. I'm probably butchering it. My apologies, Ryan. Uh, Mr. Winkless, who's your favorite actor that you've that you've had the pleasure of directing? Oh, we don't want to throw anybody under the bus. We don't want to. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I favorite say... actor. Excuse me. I thought it was worst actor. <laughs> favorite actor. Okay, that's better. Michael York. Michael York. Michael York, uh, a part, you know, he played Tybalt in Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. Right. And which blew me away, that movie. I, nobody ever made Shakespeare come alive so well as Zeffirelli did in that movie. Right. With Olivia and, Hussey, of course. Uh, he, he was just a total gentleman and he was trying to get going. He's trying to establish himself in L.A., which is why he, for some reason, accepted the part of playing this bizarre character in uh, a remake uh, of one of Roger's movies, uh, Not of This Earth. Mm. And uh, he was just a total pleasure to work with. I, I never forget being more complimented than Michael York coming to me to say, how should I play this? This is a guy who played Tybalt. Right. And he's asking me for how to play this. Well, you know, that's the, that's the job of a director. And that's it. Anyway, it was an unbelievably great pleasure. Great guy, nice guy. Amazing. That's cool. Yeah, Michael. Wow, I, I wasn't expecting that one. That's 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 yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. OK, uh, last question here. Frank says, uh, while you're writing, do you ever take into account how much the public taste has changed compared to maybe something you wrote 10 years ago? No. Good. I mean, Good that's you. a very short answer <laughs> to a very long question, but you can't really take in everything yeah as i said earlier i think that people wind up writing the same ideas because stuff is in the air stuff is happening and you react to that no matter how you slice it you're right. gonna be right. you know you're interchanging the world with your own mind but i don't take into consideration what was going on 10 years i don't remember what was going on 10 years ago right. or 10 right. minutes ago or 10 hours ago, who, who can keep track of all that? All you can do is have an idea you think is worthwhile, and the more you nurture it, if it grows, the more you nurture it, then you're probably onto something. If it doesn't grow, if it just sits there, you're probably on the wrong idea. Yeah, that's a uh, fantastic advice. And I, I think... You know, it, it's not it's not that you it's not that people shouldn't be mindful of of the world that we live in now. But to your point, I think if you if you worry about uh, tastes or trends uh, too much, I, I think you 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 lose the ability to to really write from the heart and the talents yeah. that you have because then you're catering and and trying to sort of fit when you yeah. should just be writing, you know, from, you know, as the, it's a cliche, but you know, from in here, you know, and, and yeah, that's, yeah, and that's what yeah, it's at about. At a certain point, you, you have to be able to relate to your material after all. That's right. A hundred percent. I'm writing something at the moment that is set in the seventies mm, and period piece. it's an ironic <laughs> sort of twist on things, but I'm an expert on the seventies. I... <laughs> <laughs> I was there in the seventies. You don't, I don't have to do any research at all. Yeah, I, no. I know I'm the research. I was there, is, but I was an infant, so it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's a nice <laughs> feeling actually. That's really cool. And is there anything else you can say about it or just is it kind of under wraps at the moment? I think it's not a good idea to talk about it yet. Fair enough. Fair. No, I respect that. Absolutely. Well, listen, Terrence, I really appreciate you uh, coming on here and discussing not just just uh, Justin Judson, excuse me, uh, Judson's release. 
um, but also talking about your career and your experience. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's, uh, there's no doubt valuable information that you've shared. Sometimes the, the best learning tools is, is, or, or, or the, the best way to learn is, is in a casual sort of candid setting, hearing people talk about their experience. And, and, I, uh, I hope that's true. Yeah. And I, I have no doubt that, uh, aspiring filmmakers or, or film, uh, cinephiles or whatever will, will absolutely enjoy the, the show um i'm gonna wrap it up stick around so we can sort of have more of a formal goodbye um Very good. but uh again I, I i appreciate you coming on i th this has you're been welcome, uh, a lot of fun my pleasure good questions yeah thank you i, well, you I appreciate were that you were, you were well prepared thank you i i appreciate you saying that i i i wanted to be because i i think that's the you know you, you know you have to be you know when you're interviewing somebody you have to know uh the what questions to ask and and yeah. uh because you know i think it's important for sure and not i appreciate you saying that not everybody does i can only i can <laughs> i know i've been in the i've i've been on the opposite side so i totally understand um yeah. all right folks listen that's gonna do it, do it for uh us here on episode 163 is it 163 is it jesus i can't believe i've done 163 of these things of mccray live thank you to my moderators of course frank Riker, tab of the short darren sands and chris baber for doing what you guys do i really appreciate it i'll be back of course monday night at seven o'clock p.m eastern standard time with tony you guys know the drill uh have a great rest of your weekend uh stay safe out there and uh i will talk to you guys soon all righty cheers